I'm an ecologist, which is really just another way of saying that I'm a nature nerd. I've always been fascinated by the creatures we share this planet with, so much so that I study the interactions between these species and their environments. And often when people find out that I'm an ecologist, they always want to know what sorts of cool animals I get to work with or where I adventure to do my field work. Do I spend my winters down in South America studying tree-dwelling primates, or perhaps my summers in the Canadian Arctic studying nesting seabirds? And while I would love to hike through a rainforest in the name of science, I've never actually had to travel that far to do my work. In fact, for me, it's usually a 10 minute walk down the street because I do all my field work in the city of Toronto. I'm an urban ecologist. I study the interactions between species living in cities. Now I know what you're probably thinking. There's no nature in cities, or at least not enough to warrant studying it. After all, in the process of building our cities, we have to alter and destroy natural landscapes. As a result, we do see less biodiversity in urban areas. But while there are fewer species in our cities, cities aren't devoid of nature. Think about the last time you took a walk through an urban area. Chances are you encountered nature in some form or another. Maybe it was weeds growing through cracks in the sidewalk, a bird flying down to grab some leftover food. Perhaps you've had more frustrating encounters with urban nature, had your dog sprayed by a skunk, you know, woken up to find your green bin turned over by raccoons, or my personal favorite, filled up your bird feeder only to watch the squirrels empty it and then ask for more. Although we don't always pay attention to it, there is nature in cities, and this presence of biodiversity has led many ecologists to turn their focus away from more pristine environments, to study the nature that exists in close association with humans. These urban ecologists want to understand what species persist in cities, which behaviors change, and how we can use this ecological knowledge to design cities that are good for both biodiversity and humans alike. And now more than ever, it's critical that we think about the design of our cities, because our cities are growing rapidly. Currently, over half of the 7.8 billion people on this planet live in a city. The UN predicts that by 2050, 68% of the global population will reside in an urban area. Now this growth is gonna present us with some challenges. Not all species can survive in cities, but as humans, we rely on these species and the healthy functioning ecosystems they create for a variety of services. Storm protection, water filtration, pollination of our crops. These are all services that we get from nature and depend on even in urban areas. Nature also just makes us happier and healthier. It boosts mood, improves focus and productivity, and so as we grow our cities, we need to find ways to make space for and incorporate nature into them. But as our current circumstance highlights, we have to be careful about how we mix humans and wildlife in urban areas. You know, we're currently in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm giving this talk remotely because COVID-19 has made it unsafe for us to gather. Now COVID-19, although now transmitting between humans, originated as a zoonotic disease. Zoonoses are diseases that leap from animals into humans. Things like Ebola, rabies, coronaviruses like SARS and COVID are all examples of zoonotic diseases. And while the transmission of zoonoses is rare, our cities are these interconnected hubs that bring together many species that might not otherwise mix. And so our cities, as our cities grow, we have more opportunity for zoonotic transmission and emergence of these diseases in the future. Now, as an ecologist, I spend a lot of time thinking about zoonotic diseases. In my PhD, I actually studied bats as carriers of zoonoses. I used statistics and machine learning to predict which species were undetected carriers of viruses to help us inform where we hunted for new emerging diseases in the future. But I also studied bats in cities to understand how their behaviors changed and what that might mean for disease emergence. And after five years of working with these animals, I may be a, a little bit biased, but in my opinion, they are simply the dopest group of animals in existence. But they get a really bad rep. You know, among other things, bats have been impl are implicated as a potential animal source for our current pandemic. There are also lots of myths and misconceptions that exist about this group. But the truth is the world of bats is incredible and, and wonderful. You know, bats are the only mammals, so they're like you and I, warm-blooded fuzzy things that give birth to live babies, but they are the only mammals that have the ability to fly. And to give you an idea of how special that is, flight has only ever evolved four times. Bats do it 
insects, birds, and pterosaurs, the now extinct group of flying reptiles. Bats are also the second most species-rich group of mammal. There are over 1,400 different species worldwide, and just look at that variation. You know, the world's smallest bat is the size of my thumb, while the biggest has a wingspan of over two meters. Some bats eat birds, some feed on insects, and there are three species that feed exclusively on blood. And, you know, if you're kind of on the fence about how you feel about this group, I, I get it, okay? But I have one word for you, tequila. No, seriously, if you like tequila, you should thank bats, because the species that feed on nectar pollinate things like wild agave. They pollinate things like cocoa, which we use to make chocolate and durian. The species who feed on fruit distribute seeds in our landscapes, making sure our forests grow up big and healthy. And the species who feed on insects, like the ones we have here in Toronto, are really important for pest control, which our crops benefit from. So just like the rest of nature, bats do a lot of good for humans. So as an ecologist, I thought a lot about disease, but as an urban ecologist, I was actually doing boots to the ground field work. I was trapping, tagging, and following bats around Toronto's largest fully urban park, High Park. I was trying to understand how bats were using space in the city. Where were they going at night to feed? Where were they going during the day to sleep? And while not directly related to disease transmission, this work helped to tell us more about what type of habitat bats need to survive in cities. Moving forward, this is information that we can use to both conserve bats in landscapes in our cities, but also minimize contact between them and humans. You know, but I'm only one person in a city, and just like I'm not the only person living in my city, I'm not the only scientist interested in this type of work. All over the world, there are urban ecologists asking questions about the species living in our cities. Urban ecologists like Dr. Carly Zeter. Now, Carly feels the same way about trees as I do about bats, which is to say she likes them a lot. Carly rode her bike equipped with a mobile weather station around Madison, Wisconsin. She showed that urban trees cool the air down more in the summer than the pavement heats it up. But that roughly 40% of our neighborhoods need to be covered by tree canopy for us to reap these cooling benefits. Carly's work is already being used to inform how trees are planted in cities moving forward to combat extreme heat. So work like Carly shows how valuable urban nature can be. But let's not forget about the value of one of the most abundant species living in cities. You. You and other humans are critical to the success of a lot of urban ecology projects. Many of us depend on our local communities to help us get our science done. Take, for example, Charlotte de Kaiser. Charlotte actually began her career studying the effects of climate change on bees in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. But she quickly realized there was no way she could collect the data she needed on her own. So Charlotte switched to an environment where she could crowdsource some of that data collection, a city. Charlotte started the Urban Red Bud Community Science Program. Every summer, hundreds of regular, everyday people help her by tracking when the red bud trees on their properties begin flowering. This is data that Charlotte's using to understand how flowering time changes in cities and what this means for our communities of native bees. So you have a role to play in urban ecology as well. And for the most part, while our communities can be incredibly helpful to us as scientists, sometimes the people living in cities and their pre-existing biases can actually prevent us from doing our work. This is particularly true for many urban ecologists of color, people like myself, who've had racist encounters while trying to do their science, have had the police called on them, have been racially profiled, have been perceived as a threat. Black, brown, and indigenous urban ecologists have to deal with the racism that exists in our cities and elsewhere. And because this prejudice affects both them and their communities, many don't view it as separate from their science, but instead look to understand how it shapes the biodiversity that they study. Dr. Chris Schell and Deja Perkins are two such urban ecologists. Both Chris and Deja study how racist practices like redlining, where black and brown people were prevented from buying homes in certain areas, influence where we find nature today in cities. Think about it. Economic discrepancies between neighborhoods influence who has access to the best and biggest maintained public parks. It influences whose homes back onto ravines, and so it fundamentally influences who gets to reap the most benefits from urban nature. That's not right. And for that reason, and I really can't say it any better than Chris does, 
you know, economic and, and social inequality are not just social justice issues. These are ecological ones too. And knowing this will help us do our science better. I feel very fortunate. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was on a Skype call with Chris. Uh, I'm currently writing my first children's book for Anik Press, all about urban ecology, of course. And Chris is one of eight scientists whose stories and work I'm featuring in this book. Chris and I talked for nearly two hours. It was the first time I talked to another urban ecologist of color. It was the first time that I learned about how you could integrate you know, social justice with ecological research. And as Chris explained his ongoing work quantifying the legacy of racial and class imbalances on biodiversity in cities, something finally clicked for me. That as much as I think I became an ecologist to study the cool exotic species I grew up watching on naked nature documentaries, as a scientist, I've come to find studying the nature in our cities far more alluring. Now, don't get me wrong, if given the opportunity, I will totally go down to South America to catch me some little Mohawk having bats. But there's something really special about studying the nature in cities. You know, as an urban ecologist, I get to do science in my own community. I have this opportunity to unite the social and racial justice issues that I'm passionate about with the ecological ones I also care for. As an urban ecologist, I get to talk to everyday people. I get to show them how science is being done. And for that reason, while a city may not be the first place that comes to mind when we think of nature, I think with the right energy, cities can be the kind of places where we can foster the local stewardship we need to motivate global conservation. Hear me out. What if we could open everyone's eyes to the nature that surrounds them in cities? What if we could design cities and make sure that nature was distributed equally, regardless of race or class? Can you imagine a world in which all children have access to natural spaces and people who encourage their love and respect for them? This might just help a generation grow up understanding why it's important to conserve nature at a global scale, because they learned how to see, protect, and care for it locally first. Now, in saying this, my goal is not to have everyone feel like I do about bats or Carly does about trees. But as a minimum, after listening to this, I want all of you to go out there and see some of that nature that exists in cities. Maybe it's rabbit tracks in the mud, a red-tailed hawk gliding above a thermal on a downtown core. Or perhaps you'll notice that the tree at the end of your street is different from the one at the beginning. And maybe you'll even care enough to learn their names. I want all of you to see some of that nature. Because when we see nature, we begin to understand its value. And could you imagine the change we could create if every one of the over 4 billion people on this planet living in a city saw just enough nature that they decided they wanted to make a small change to protect it? Thank you. <laughs>